Good morning. Is this not just a beautiful day that God has prepared for us so that we could come out and worship him? Amen? Amen. Let me ask you to stand as you're able and sing as you will. We're going to sing Hosanna, Praise is Rising.
my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Let's do that again. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Lord, prepare
And I want you in mind, in heart, in spirit, in body, just to say, thank you, God. Thank you for touching my life, that I am not the same person I was before I knew you. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He provides for all our needs. All we need to do is open up and ask. And all he asks is that we praise and we worship him and we serve him and we love him and we love his people. So this time as you sing, I exalt thee, I want you to lift your hearts as high as they go and sing to God. I exalt change we've seen miracles so we gather here this morning thankful for your amazing power to change this life to change lives and change this world 
There are others of us who have gathered here this morning where this has been a week filled with disappointment, filled with despair, filled with news that we did not want to hear, and we're now filled with worry and, and great anxiety. We gather here this morning asking for your peace, asking for your presence because we need you. God, we've opened our hearts, we've shared with you what's going on in our lives, in our community, and in our world. Bring that peace, bring that presence, bring your healing. And for all of us who have gathered here in this place, we ask that you move in a powerful way this morning. You grab hold of our souls, you lean close, and you whisper into our ears how much you love us. God, we ask for your blessing. Let it begin in this moment as we join all of our voices together and pray that prayer that you taught us long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stand together and sing, starting with In the Morning. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Wozlick, and my wife and I have been attending here for about eight years now. First thing I'd like to say is I'm a recovering heathen. <clears throat> I am. I've been a heathen longer than I've been longer than half of my life, living life. I was born up in New England. I was raised in the Catholic Church. Uh, I was an altar boy or acolyte, whatever you want to call it. Um, then my parents got divorced when I was nine years old. Well, in the Catholic Church, out we went. Okay, But there's one thing or two things that stuck in my mind about the Catholic Church all my life. And that is, only the priest could give you communion. And secondly, they passed the collection basket twice every Sunday. First was for the church, second was for the mission. Um, but once <clears throat> my family was out, Never kind of felt to go back. Um, followed the faith loosely, and then I joined the Navy. Heathenism really came into play there. 20 years, one month, and four days, but who counted? I was heathen. But I think it had a lot to do with my upbringing and uh, the matriarch of our family, my grandmother, was Catholicism is, is it, and that's it, and the only person that could ever give me communion was a priest, so... That led out lay leaders and non-Catholics. But lo and behold, I met Terry. We decided we wanted to get back in the church, and we did. Especially since our daughters, her daughters wanted to get married in churches. So we found the church, and we spent about, about eight years there, too. Uh, one of the nice things that, about that church that had a full of history, 
And uh, it was a Methodist church, full of history. And uh, they had lots of money. The only problem was with all that money, they had it all in restricted funds. And there's unrestricted funds and restricted funds in a church. So if it's in restricted, it can only be used for that function. So they had lots and lots of money in the building fund and lots and lots of money in this fund. But it had just enough for the pastor's salary and everything else. The only problem is the church never wanted to build. It was more or less maintaining its 250-year-old existence to keep the building in its natural state. So we got a little tired of this, and they didn't want to go out and do mission work. So we started looking, and we found Courthouse about eight years ago. And it's a mission church, and we love it. We've loved it ever since. Okay, But I need to come here almost every Sunday like Wayne and Edie. Following them is a tough act, by the way. <laughs> How I got this week, I don't know, Wayne. But it was tough following you. Um, we do a lot of good mission work here. And it's impacted my family deeply, including my grandson who comes here every Wednesday night with me to help in the community dinner. And he always looks at me and goes, how come these people need food, Grandpa? He says, well, some of them aren't, are less fortunate than we are. He goes, well, what happens if we don't have any extras so I could eat? I says, Grandpa's got enough money in his wallet to go to Wendy's on the way home. You'll be fed. Okay, but it's about, and he understands that now. It took a year or two, but we got him in the right spot. But the church needs money. There's no doubt about it. We need to live. It's the foundation that the church is based on is we got to pay our light bills and everything else. Plus, we need to do our mission work. So with that being said, this morning at the 830 service, they did a hymn, and I'd like to do this as my prayer as the ushers come up and get ready to do the collection. Dear Heavenly Father, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen.
Most of us know it's uh, true that Virginia Beach is filled with kids, and all summer long they get to spend the summer uh, laughing, playing, uh, enjoying life, and we hear this, this, uh, this sort of undercurrent, this roar of noise of kids in most of our neighborhoods as they're uh, doing whatever it is that kids do during the summertime to play. And if you've been listening in the past couple of days, you know that uh, that, uh, that undertone, that noise, it's gone, right? Because the kids are back in school. And so if you happen to be home during the day and you listen, there's not that, that noise that, that we used to he- uh, hear because uh, Virginia Beach was full of, was full of kids. Uh, even my neighborhood, uh, there are lots of kids uh, in my neighborhood, and it's gotten awfully quiet here lately. Uh, I know that uh, over the summer you could hear them uh, from the early, early in the morning until late at night playing, riding bikes, uh, heading down the street to visit friends, whatever it was. And, and uh, it, it sort of even in the, the row of houses that I live in, uh, to my left, there's a, a family with a, a little boy that lives there. And uh, the house right next to me on the right is uh, empty. It's for sale. It's been for sale for a long time. And then the house next to that has got a couple of kids, a uh, little boys, about the same age as the one on my left. And uh, they're, they're good friends and they uh, talk to each other and uh, they'll stand in their backyard. You know how it is Virginia Beach? Sometimes our backyards face each other, but we're on different streets, so you have to kind of uh, go a long way around. And kids are kids. They're pretty smart. And uh, they would stand in their backyards, one on, on the bank over here on this side uh, by the water and one on the bank over here, and they'd scream to each other during the day to talk to each other. And uh, then I noticed this summer they also, uh, because the house next to ours is uh, empty, uh, they, uh, the uh, ones with, uh, to the right, they uh, figured out that they can hop the fence from their yard into the empty yard. This is the backyards. Hop the fence into our yard and then uh, go on over to see their friend on the other side, and they don't have to go the long way around. They don't have to scream either at each other, and so uh, it was kind of funny to watch and didn't bother us, and we'd watch them. Well, uh, early in the summer, uh, I came home one evening, and there was a guy standing on the front porch. He had a kid with him, a little boy. Didn't recognize him when I pulled in, and and so when I got there, there was nobody else at the house. He turned around, and it was the neighbor from two houses down. I know because the kids go to, the boys go to scouts here whenever we have scouts, and so I had met them here at church, and I see them in the neighborhood as well either. And so uh, he was standing there, and the little boy was looking down at the ground. He was almost in tears. Uh, you could see, like, big uh, wet eyes, right, as he kind of looked at me. And the dad said, uh, you, got a, you got something to say to uh, Mr. McMillan? And the kid mumbled something, and the dad said, uh, he can't hear you. And so he, uh, he mumbled again. He said, I'm sorry. Right? And I said, I'm thinking, well, what, did, what did he do? Right? Dad said, uh, tell him what you're sorry for. And, uh, and the kid said, uh, the little boy said, uh, I'm sorry that I climbed the fence and cut through your backyard to go visit uh, Aiden on the other side. And, uh, and the kid was crying by this time. And I'm like, I'm, of course, I'm, you know, right? I'm like, who cares? Right? But uh, apparently this dad did. And so I had to support the dad. And so I said, well, you know, it's okay. And the dad says, I told him not to do it, and he disobeyed me. Well, of course, you know, that was the the issue. But um, so he's not ever going to do it again, right? Never going to cross through your yard again. And I'm thinking, you know, 30 seconds through my yard or five minutes around, if they're a kid, that's a lifetime. But I said, okay, that's fine, you know, whatever. And uh, and so these kids are smart, right? They're scouts. And so uh, about a week later, uh, they had rigged up a zip line, right? Um, (laughs) to cross the water to get to the other side, okay? And he's not disobeying anybody, right, in this. And <laughs> so I said, watch them zooming back and forth uh, to each other's yard uh, during the summer. And, um, and every once in a while, and they laugh, you know, kids, the noise, the noise of summer, laugh, having the best time flying through the air, right? And every once in a while, they would let go and fall into the water. And, you know, in, in the water's kind of deep. And I watched him because it was, uh, you know, it's uh, one of these uh, stretchy, freaky kind of things because the water is, if you've been following me on Facebook this summer, you know we've taken pictures of the huge snapping turtles that are in the water, right? And uh, they come up and they're laying eggs in our yard and, and like, they're huge. These, uh, and I, I may be prone to exaggeration, but this is, uh, these are huge. I would not go in the water, but um, they're kids, right? And apparently it, nothing uh, no, didn't bother them, and so they would zip across the, the water at each other's houses, fall in, the dogs are in the water, and everybody's having a blast and, and uh, having a great time. And, and I watched them. Of course, they're now back at school, right? And quiet, nothing happening anymore. But uh, for a few weeks this summer, they were flying. 
They were soaring through the air. And uh, every once in a while, every once in a while, in the midst of flying and all of that joy that comes from this, they'd let go and they'd fall into darkness, into danger, snapping turtle, hell, whatever it is, you know, and every once in a while they had to let go and fall into the darkness. Have you ever thought about flying? I mean, uh, birds do it, planes do it, and uh, at least on TV or in books or in our imagination, angels fly as well. Uh, angels are kind of a big deal. People write books about them, talking about encounters that they have with them, uh, some word that comes in, or somebody has a near-death experience and they experience an angel. Uh, we talked about this at 8.30. Some people came up afterwards and told me stories of it, encounters that uh, people have had with angels. Anybody, I, I don't want to leave anybody, anybody here have an angel encounter that they want to share? Anybody at all? Have a friend who had one? Anybody? Read about one? Bought a book about one, right? Yeah. Well, they're bestsellers, so you probably did. But uh, uh, angels, uh, a- angels are a big deal, and, and they've been a big deal uh, since, uh, I don't know, forever. Uh, angels are talked a lot about, uh, even in the Bible. Uh, if you read the Bible, it doesn't take you long to, to find out that uh, angels are uh, everywhere in the Bible. And um, if you read the Bible, then uh, angels in the Bible, we find out some certain things about angels if you read the Bible. One is that, uh, according to the Bible, angels are spiritual beings. Um, they're not like humans. They are uh, heavenly creatures, and, uh, and so they're spiritual. Uh, this is talked about if you read the Christmas story. Uh, you, you saw the video that uh, the 830 Choir is uh, recruiting some people to help with the holiday uh, holiday music that they're doing, special music, that's, uh, you know, i.e. Christmas, right? And so uh, if, uh, if you're interested, you can uh, talk to Cindy. But uh, in the Christmas story, angels are everywhere, okay, and uh, talking to people, and, and they're just showing up. Angels also are uh, called in Scripture ministering spirits that uh, uh, Psalm 103.20 talks about how God sends angels to people that are afraid and and people that are struggling, and, and uh, that those, those, uh, those angels help out in times of, of trouble. Um, in uh, Matthew 26, 15, we find that angels uh, number in the millions. This is the Christmas, uh, this is the story where Jesus is there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, he's being arrested, and he talks about how, if he wants to, he could call down millions of angels. Uh, in the Christmas story, we read that and sing about the heavenly host, uh, the real translation of that is uh, the army of God, okay? And that's what angels are really called in Scripture and that they number in the millions. And um, uh, we also find uh, Luke 2, angels are from heaven, but they come down and sometimes visit um, earth and um, bring messages from God. And in Second Thessalonians 1, we find that angels are powerful, that God can use them to bring fire and... and uh, and strength whenever God is needing to do something uh, miraculous to happen. And so uh, angels all over in Scripture. In our world today, some people believe in angels. Some people have seen angels. Some people have experienced some angelic visit. Other people don't believe in angels. Uh, Other people think that it's some kind of uh, uh, in our imagination. Some people think that it's uh, some uh, manifestation of something going on in our emotions or in our minds. And we're transferring on to uh, these visits. I mean, whatever. But uh, people have different opinions on whether there are angels or they're not. But there is an overarching understanding of why uh, God uses angels. Uh, that the Bible teaches us about uh, God's use of angels. That uh, is sort of the, the bigger picture here, whether you believe in angels or not. One is that uh, God watches over us uh, when angels come. It's uh, in Scripture, it's usually a time whenever uh, sometimes God needs to bring some guidance, some uh, investment into uh, our lives and wants to uh, take care of us. 
uh, whenever there is some uh, time of struggle. Uh, you remember in uh, the story, Jesus is born and angels come to Joseph and they tell Joseph he's got to get out and go to Egypt to keep the child safe, that uh, God's there sending angels to watch over us. Second thing that angels teach us is that God cares about us, that uh, God is uh, intimately involved in our lives and wants to be there for us and to uh, help us in those times of of trouble in uh, Psalm 91, it, it says that uh, God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways, that God cares about us. And so uh, that's uh, the real message of angels sometimes. And uh, third is that uh, angels teach us that God, uh, God intervenes. God will send an angel in Scripture to guide somebody to do something they might not normally do. There's a story of Philip where he is living out his life, and God says, I want you to go to this deserted place where there never is any people, because I'm going to have an encounter with you, the angel tells Philip, and Philip goes, and he meets the Ethiopian, and it's a God moment for that. And so um, there, there's, uh, there's some things we can learn, whether we believe in angels or not, but angels are evident, highly evident in Scripture. Uh, they're from heaven, they're soaring, they're flying, and periodically they come down into our world, the darkness of our world, according to Scripture. And uh, let us know that uh, God's still involved. Last week we began a journey where we looked at the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is uh, identified as one of the hardest to understand books in the Bible. Okay? And our kids are back to school and they're expanding their brains. So I thought that we'd spend a couple of weeks expanding our brains a little bit by looking at something that is really difficult, the book of Hebrews. Some of you are reading the book of Hebrews right now in your daily devotions, been talking about it, sending me some emails with some questions. So uh, I want to encourage that for you to continue that because this is a tough book, mostly tough because it's uh, speaking to a, a group and a culture that uh, we're, we have a hard time getting our hands around. Last week we talked about one of the themes in the book of Hebrews is that God, is, Jesus is greater than the law. Jesus is greater than uh, the rules and that Jesus is the lens that we need to look through life through if we're going to uh, obey certain laws or not obey certain laws, and we talked about that last week. Another theme that is evident clearly in Hebrews is this uh, discussion of angels, and um, it's woven throughout, but there at the very beginning, beginning at uh, verse 5 of chapter 1, there's this long expanse of uh, reading about angels, and the basic understanding is that angels are something everybody's talking about whoever's reading the book of Hebrews initially. Lots of you are interested in angels. Lots of you have seen angels. Some of you believe them. Some of you don't. But Jesus is greater. And so what I'd like for you to do, uh, either listen as we read a few verses from Hebrews 1 and into Hebrews 2, or if you'd like, just to try to uh, be a little different, is to take out um, the Bible that's in front of you. Uh, that's uh, the Red Bible. And turn to page 971, way in the back, for the book of Hebrews and uh, follow along, and uh, this talks about Jesus and angels and how they relate and how they're connected and the roles of each, okay, according to uh, Scripture. So, Hebrews 1, beginning at verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, this is a rhetorical question, uh, you're my son, today I have begotten you. Of course, the answer is uh, no angel ever heard that. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Rhetorical question, again, uh, no angel heard this. Now, just so uh, give you a sort of a footnote, the author of Hebrews is uh, making the case that Jesus is greater than angels, and the author of Hebrews is actually using scripture passages from their Bible, because they didn't have a New Testament at that time. All they had as their Bible was the Old Testament. And so they're quoting scriptures from the Old Testament and uh, using them to create a case that Jesus is greater than angels, okay? Uh, verse uh, 6. And again, uh, when he, God, brings the firstborn into the world, God says, let all, let all God's angels worship him. This is Jesus. Of the angels, God says, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire, but of the Son, God says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, speaking of Jesus, with the oil of gladness beyond your companions, meaning you're more than the angels, your heavenly companions. And, verse 10, 
In the beginning, uh, the Lord, you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing, like a cloak, like a cloak, you will roll them up. And like clothing, they will be changed. But you, Jesus, are the same and your years will never end. But to you, but to which of the angels has God ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Um, Of course, the answer is none. And not all angel spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit, and are not all angel spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Meaning there's some kind of conversation going on at that moment that the readers in Hebrews, the original listeners in Hebrews, uh, were, were wrestling with. For if the message declared to you through angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Meaning the angels came and interceded, brought some kind of word, and the word really pointed to Jesus who brings us salvation. It was declared at first through the Lord, it was attested to us by those who heard him, while while God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to God's will. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? What are human beings, God, that you care about them at all? Or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjugation to them, but we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels when he became human, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should, have, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. What that's saying is, it's fitting that Jesus became human, God became human, to experience what we experience. For the one who sanctifies, and those who are sanctified, the one who uh, becomes what God wants us to be, are all, one, all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And again, quoting again from Scripture, or from quotes of Jesus, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he, Jesus, himself likewise shared the same things. So that through death, Jesus might destroy the one who has the power of death, that's the devil, and free those who who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that Jesus did not come to help the angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, Jesus had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that Jesus might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of people. Because he himself is tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who also are being tested, like you and me. And so what these, uh, these verses, uh, as, as they're talking about it, they say that uh, Jesus Christ is uh, better than the angels uh, because he's the Son of God. This is uh, from Hebrews 1.5 that it's quoting from Psalm 2. Uh, it also says that Jesus is greater than the angels because Jesus is the fulfillment of promises. At Christmas time, we read about Isaiah and, and a lot of other passages from the Old Testament, which would have been the Bible at that time, that talk about Jesus. Jesus is also greater than the angels because he is a sovereign. The angels worship him, Scripture tells us. Uh, the angel acknowledges that he is God and uh, that he is the one who creates everything. Also, Jesus is greater than the angels, according to Hebrews 1, uh, 7 and 9, because his ministry and his rule is eternal, never ends. Angels come for particular moments, specific events, and then they leave. Jesus is greater than angels because Jesus is the creator of all things, Hebrew, Hebrews 1 and Psalm 102. And Jesus is greater than angels because he rules over his enemies. From Hebrews 1 and Psalm 110. When the book of Hebrews uh, was actually a letter to a group of people was first 
heard. It must have been a time when people were very fascinated with angels. Whenever they had people testifying that they had seen angels, had some kind of encounter with angels. When news was spreading around that angels were uh, involved in people's lives. And so there was a question during that time. You know, um, does it make someone more spiritual if they've had an angel encounter than someone who doesn't? Does it make someone closer to God if they believe in angels as opposed to someone who, who doesn't? And this, this theme of, uh, of the role of angels is woven all the way throughout the book of Hebrews, if you, if you read it. In fact, uh, there's a popular verse in chapter 13, which is way towards the end, that says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. But somehow angels are at work in us, and we, we may encounter them, but never know. And so there was this conversation whenever the book of Hebrews was first heard to that uh, initial audience, that initial church, uh, because angels were the topic of the day. But what the writer of Hebrews was trying to get across to them and to us as well is that Jesus is greater than the angels. In fact, the angels were people sent by God, or are being sent by God to come in at particular moments to do a particular um, job, particular duty, give a particular message. And then as they were flying and soaring and then they came down into the, the darkness of our world, uh, they left. But in our faith, Jesus came as one of us, experienced the things that we experienced suffered, experienced pain. We suffer, we experience pain. And he did all of that so that then, as Scripture says in Hebrews, as Jesus was greater than the angels, he did all of this so that he would understand us and become for us that bridge that takes us from people who were outside a relationship with God ones who are part of the brothers and sisters, the family of God. It talks about in Hebrews 1 and 2. And the other thing that makes this more pivotal for us in our faith journey, we, we hold on to this. Uh, Jesus never leaves us. That when we have this encounter with Jesus, it's not a, a one-time thing that we can run around and tell people that there was a time years ago I had this, this moment. And now Jesus is with us all the time. Hebrews 1 and 2 talks about the spirit then that comes and lives inside of us. It's Jesus. It doesn't use the word trinity, but it's a, a, a trinity understanding woven throughout the first two chapters that there's God, there's Jesus, there's the Holy Spirit. They're all one. They're all working together to hold us, to love us, to guide us, to intervene in our lives, to give us peace, to give us direction, to give us healing, to be uh, God's presence with us always. This week, I don't know what life is going to have for you, and you don't know what life is going to have for me. But this I know is that for many of us, this will be a difficult week. There'll be moments sometimes when it might really seem like, I don't know, we're soaring, life is good. But a lot of the time for most of us, this week is going to be filled with great pain and suffering. And if we're not careful, we'll kind of look for some glimpses of hope that's there or somebody to intervene or somebody to swoop out of the skies. And Here's the challenge. If Jesus Christ is alive in us, it's not a every once in a while kind of thing. That the God of all creation lives inside of us. And that Spirit of God is holding us, loving us, and intervening in our lives all the time. So in the struggles and the pain that you're going to face this week and I'm going to face this week, remember Hebrews chapters 1 and 2. Our Jesus is greater than the angels. Pray with me. God, you love us so much. 
we forget that sometimes or we see somebody who tells us tells a story about some encounter that we've never had and we start to doubt but god <laughs> he came among us you came from the heavens and you came down into the darkness of our world because you love us help us to never forget that you walk beside us and we're not alone hold us because we need it guide us because there is no direction but yours and God we ask that in those moments of great pain and struggle you give us your peace in Christ's name we pray amen let us stand and sing celebrating God's great love for each of us and share that love with everyone we meet.